Welcome. This is Bleacher Blums, a sports podcast for baseball fans. Now here's Dave Tuttle and the Astros' master of banter, Blummer. I am. Yeah, we got the good Wi-Fi going. Hopefully it sticks together with us because we are back. The bleachers are open, and I know a lot of you have missed us. It's been a long time, uh, what, a couple weeks now since we've been there. And something's a little bit different with you, Tuttle. I know I haven't seen you on Zoom. We've texted here and there. But, uh, you know, there's something going on that I just can't point out because I don't necessarily see it around here or, like, here. It's more like right here. Yeah, you right, right there. Man? Oh, I Do see we need that. to worry about you? No, you don't need to worry about me. You know, uh, this is what happens when you get old and you spend most of your life in the sun. So I had a little uh, little basal cell thing removed today. But this is, I mean, you know, according to the doctor, this is the pressure pad just to keep it down. So this comes off in about 10 hours. So if we could have waited 10 hours to record, I could have been my, <laughs> my normal beautiful self. But, uh, but we had to jump on, man. We had to get on. The Astros have started playing baseball and the MLB is underway. And we might have avoided a shutdown, but we're not 100% sure about that either. So, uh, yeah, no, it's great to see you. Yeah, there's something a little bit different about me, but I'm going to be about two pounds lighter after uh, after uh, all the skin she cut out and uh, hopefully a lot healthier as well. Yeah, I'm glad that you're getting that taken care of. All the best in healing up quickly. I know that you're a pretty strong, healthy, relatively young man, and uh, hopefully this is just a little little something that you took care of to to avoid future incidents I know that, you know, playing baseball, I don't know if you can tell it, but I've got like this patch of white. There's barely barely uh, any pigment in my neck because it's been just pummeled by the sun. I've got all kinds of skin damage, but uh, it's the nature of the beast and being out there. But put on your sunscreen, take care of yourself. Don't end up like Tuttle and I. But uh, I'm glad that you're doing okay and you're healthy. And you hit on what basically is on tap, brought to you by St. Arnold on this podcast. We're going to have to hit it pretty quick because there's a 6-10 game, the second game of a two-game series against the Dodgers, and it got relatively heated last night when Joe Kelly took it upon himself to throw at Alex Bregman and talk a little trash to Carlos Correa. I've got some thoughts on that. I'm sure Tuttle does, too, out there on the West Coast. Uh, We have some Astro injuries, some pitching injuries around the league that maybe Tuttle can enlighten us about. And, of course, like Tuttle mentioned, the Marlins are going through some serious issues, and there's some question marks raised around the league especially in that Miami area and the Miami Marlins. So we will get to that. We also got what will Tuttle say real quick. I have a quick Blum's Blast. But uh, make sure you go to the Social Nostra Network on YouTube and check out the video of our podcast. Those things have been exploding. I know that they've been wanting us to get a, get a video back up for them. So here we are. The audio podcast is still doing really good on iTunes and most uh, I, I, uh, I almost said iTunes platforms, but uh, podcast platforms. Uh, Spotify, Our Heart Radio, and things like that. Uh, those have been going very well, so we appreciate everybody doing that. I know that we've been pushing a little bit more swag out on the bleacherblums.com uh, website, which has been going good, but it is good to be back in the mix. And Tuttle, did you catch any of the action last night between the Astros and Dodgers? Because without COVID, we wouldn't have this matchup until next season. And what's interesting is that in 2021, we will have a matchup between the Dodgers and Astros in both Minute Maid Park and Dodger Stadium, where there hopefully will be fans. But for the time being, the way the COVID crisis has hit the Major League Baseball, it allowed the schedule to have a matchup of Dodgers and Astros, and we had a little bit of a flare-up. Did you see it? Uh, I saw the highlights of it. And let me just say, I know we welcome me in with this little patch here, but uh, it's great to be back. I think the word of the day is quick. Like you said, you have a 6-10 game and we ran through on tap quickly. So folks, this one might be a quick podcast, but it's going to be full of content. And um, yeah, I did see it. And it's kind of interesting as we've talked about with roster moves and guys moving around. Joe Kelly, you know, came up with the Cardinals and he was a Red Sox. Now he's a Dodger, but he decides to take it upon himself. Like I'm a Dodger. The Dodgers got screwed out of a World Series. You know, he was kind of a peripheral guy on that team if he was even on the team, if I can recall, 17. I think that's when he joined the Dodgers. But anyway, I just – I didn't watch the whole thing, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and kind of give me some some yeah. fodder for uh, for reaction. I obviously have opinions. I, I work for the Astros, but I try and understand the situation. And for those of you who don't remember, if you're listening to this podcast for the first time, 2017 – 
The Astros were accused of cheating. Rob Manfred picked them out and found a way to, uh, to put it on paper that they cheated. Uh, the trash can banging and so on. Uh, how much of it was used and to what effect is up to interpretation. I know that uh, there's a newspaper article in Duke today written by uh, Duke University students who actually went through and analyzed all of the data and you can draw your own conclusion. They drew the conclusion that it really didn't help that much. But anyways, it has been confirmed that the Astros cheated during the 2017 season. I love that people say that I deny it. I have never denied it. I've got my boy across there in the West Coast who has heard me not deny it. We accept it. We have moved on from it. We understand it's a part of the game. Now, that being said, last night, the Dodgers come into town, and I think there's two pitchers, maybe one pitcher on the active roster who actually pitched in that 2017 World Series. Joe Kelly was not one of them. Ross Stripling and Alex Wood, who actually just went on the injured list, were the two pitchers that were active during that World Series who pitched against the Dodgers in that World Series and may have a little more of a, of a bone to pick with the against Astros. Against the Astros, you mean? Yeah, against yeah. the Astros, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, against the Dodgers. Just... Um, that uh, have a little bit more of a bone to pick against the Astros. So, in the sixth inning, Joe Kelly comes in, who has a history of throwing at guys anyways. He sparked a fight between the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox in that heated rivalry. But he signed with the uh, Dodgers in 2019 uh, and is now a member of their team in 2020. I was right. Yeah. He wasn't even there. He wasn't even there. He did right. get abused in that in the playoffs in 2017 by, uh, <laughs> by uh, Astro hitting. So That's maybe right. there's a little lingering effect from that. But he got behind on Alex Bregman 3-0 and proceeded to throw a pitch. Uh, behind him at about 96 miles an hour up towards that shoulder region, you know, where the name is. And, you know, you can say it's at the head, you can say it's at the shoulders, neck, whatever it is, but there was intent behind it. Um, this day and age, we know that uh, Major League Baseball said that they're going to come down relatively hard on those who instigate fights or actually do fight. And I think that the message was sent and Alex Bregman had the look on his face like, okay, I wasn't prepared for that one to come up around the backside of my neck, but I knew I was going to be thrown at. And you have to understand, too, and I believe that the Astros understand that they are going to be targeted. Uh, they, they did their best to apologize, but that didn't go over well with a lot of people, and they are going to be targeted. They expect to be hit, and I think Alex Braven kind of had that look on his face like, okay, you're going to throw at me, but if you're going to throw at me, square me up in the butt, square me up in the thigh, square me up in the rib cage, but try and keep it down a little bit. And that's where I think Joe Kelly kind of copped out a little bit and just threw it behind him. I won't hit him so I don't get fined and I don't get suspended, but I'll send the message. And Alex went to first. There were three pickoff throws that were on purpose. I don't know what he was trying to do and making Alex dive back. But anyways, fast forward to Carlos Correa's at bat. A couple of backup sliders, you know, move Alex around. I mean, move Carlos around, knock him down. They have a little staring contest in between. And eventually, Joe Kelly strikes out Carlos Correa on a great pitch, a slider down and away. And he proceeds to say, according to Dusty Baker, Nice swing, bitch. Now, if he would have screamed, that's what you get for cheating, maybe Carlos goes, okay, maybe I deserve that. Yeah. Or if he said something else, but he said, nice swing, bitch. That is a personal comment. And that's why Carlos Correa and the Astros bench kind of did what they did. You can hear everything out there. And the Astros took umbrage with that. There was a play at first base that Joe Kelly kind of exaggerated a little bit. So there was all of a sudden it snowballed really quick, but that's basically the synopsis of what happened. Um, but there's a couple of things I want to remind you of because Tuttle hit on it. We've talked about Joe Kelly signing with the Dodgers in 2019. So the 2018 Red Sox, if I do recall, relatively uh, early on in this year were accused of cheating and they fired their manager, and they fired their uh, video guy, huh? And according to Yankee and Dodger fan logic, that means that Joe Kelly cheated too because he was on that 2018 team, right? I'm so with you. you've got a cheater throwing at a cheater to get back for a team that was cheated against that Joe Kelly wasn't a part of until now. Right. Interesting. The other thing is, is how short of a memory do the Dodger fans have? Because if you go back to 2019, well, other than him having a ring in 2018, beating the Dodgers in the World Series, if you go back to the postseason in 2019, Joe Kelly's ERA in the postseason, and this might be why the Dodgers didn't get to their third straight World Series, Joe Kelly's ERA was 23.14. 
says, all right. And that was in two and a third innings when he gave up a grand slam to uh, Howie Kendrick that propelled the uh, Washington Nationals to the World Series. Now enter Joe Kelly, and he throws it uh, Bregman and causes a little bit of stir. Memory erased. Everything's good. It doesn't matter that you didn't get us to the World Series after signing that massive contract. But that's those are my opinions. Tuttle, let me in on some insight. What am I missing here, man? No, you're not missing anything. I think it's funny to draw that direct line that you did, which is uh, funny, like Joe Kelly, like upset, and then he did this and he did that. I mean, none of this stuff is a direct line. And I said this before in competition, and you know guys like this, when you know you talk about a guy being a BP hitter or a BP pitcher, like Joe Kelly on paper, I mean, the oh. guy throws 97, 98, he's got a wicked slider. But, you know, a guy with his stuff should not have a 23 ERA in, no. any, in any postseason or any game. And I think what happens is um, I've heard Joe Rogan talk about this with UFC fighters. You watch a guy train in the gym. I see it in, in workouts that I do. And I, I played with guys like this, as, as did you. There are some guys when the light, lights get bright and the heat <laughs> gets, you know, the oven heat gets turned up, they don't function as well. And I think what you see is almost a um, – uh, like a, an adrenaline rush. Uh, like, you know, once he hit, like once he hit Bregman or I'm sorry, once he threw behind Bregman, like you said, it could have been over and done with like, all right, all right, I'll take my base or whatever. That's, that's actually a good point. I didn't bring up, but you're right. You could have, he Bregman handled it, yep. went to first and that could have been it. Right. And that's where that's I'm starting this point, whole actually. incident, right? Cause you're adding these Man. other pieces that Carlos Correa and you're like, that's when his adrenaline got going, right? We've had that rush. Like, Ooh, that was close. A car wreck oh, or yeah. something like, or I was riding my bike and Oh, the guy opened his door. Like you get that rush. How do you handle that rush? And it takes a uh, mature person, but it also takes some experience to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm not letting Joe Kelly off the hook. I'm just saying we've all played with guys that were great batting practice hitters, guys that could throw a hundred, but then when the lights got on and, you know, game time hit, couldn't get anybody out and couldn't hit the ball. And I think that's what you're seeing with Joe Kelly in the sense that he didn't know how to handle a situation. Like, all right, his adrenaline, I've thrown at guys before and I've gotten charged before and your adrenaline, like your heart rate goes way up and you're like, huh, you know, the intensity is there. How do you handle that intensity? And what I think happened is Joe Kelly threw, um, you know, we've done this as pitchers, but nobody will admit it, right? It's three Oh, you don't want to face this guy. You're not going to throw him a meatball. So, you know, you throw something. Try that, and get one in know, there. Yeah, try to get one in there. And if it misses him, it misses him. If it hits him, yeah, he's going to take his base anyway. And, you know, just let him know that you're not afraid to get in there. So, you know, that part happened. And then once he got to first, and like you said, now the adrenaline's pumping. There's three throws over to first. Like, come on. And then there's the Carlos Correa thing and talking smack. And, you know, I, I don't know if any of this has anything to do with 2017 or 2018. What I think this has to do with is Joe Kelly wants to be an integral part of the team. He probably felt internally like he's standing up for, you know, I'm a Dodger. I'm going to show him I'm a true dot, you know, true blue Dodger. And I'm going to kind of show him I'm not afraid to do this. And then what happened is adrenaline got the best of him and he got out of hand. And, you know, as you said, just like with umpires, you never want to use a personal affront. Like it's all good <laughs> when you say, you know, you're having a terrible night, but when you tell them they're terrible, you know, yeah. in other colorful terms, I think that's the same thing with Correa. And I think you have to react as a guy like, Hey, that's for cheating. And that's why I'm out here talking smack. Like, all right, you can deal with that. Or, you know, that's for all of you, something like that. But when you mm -hmm. like, you know, when you punk a guy and he's a professional, like it's just not, it's not the right way to handle it. And it's certainly, you can see why everybody got um, up in arms. Yeah. I'm with you in the creativity. It would have been much better if he would have struck Carlos out. And I'm just thinking off the top of my head yeah. and always, you know, the next day we always come up with the best retorts oh, anyways. Yeah. But uh, if he would have said, where was the trash can on that one? Or, you know, something <laughs> That's a like, good retort. you know, something that would have been directly at the 2017 season and really, and, and drawn that line of that's why I'm talking trash or that's yeah. why I threw behind Alex. And then you could have been, okay, he's yeah. trying to cover the back of the guys who are still on the Dodger team from 2017, or he's trying to direct it at the Astros organization and saying, we didn't accept your apology. We, we thought you wronged the game. You know, whatever the reason may be, but it could have been more specific to that. But to your point about Carlos Correa, you know, if you're challenged as a man, you know, you got to appreciate the fact that Carlos said, wait a minute, you just called me, you know, you just said, nice swing, bitch. Okay. By the way, I'm three for four in the game. Yeah. And the only runs that have been scored are off the swings I took. So in this instance, you beat me. And Carlos even admitted it as much. 
But you're right. He's got to stand up. And once he stands up, the team's going to stand up behind him. And that's why you have everybody come out. And I don't know if you caught some of the audio uh, there. There was actually, they picked up a mic where Carlos basically said, Hey, good pitch. You stroke, you struck me out. That's fine. Take the strike out and go away. Yeah. Uh, if I hit a home run, you know, it's my decision on if I'm going to pimp it or not. And I probably wouldn't have pimped it. I would have hit it and just ran around the bases like he did earlier. Um, but I think you bring up an excellent point in the sense of the way that baseball manages and controls some of these, these issues where you're trying to get retribution for something. It's usually with wham, I hit the guy, he goes to first or he comes out, we brawl, whatever it is. But in this case, Alex went to first and then you're like, yeah, you're done. I said my piece, we move on. And then even after the three pickoff attempts and, you know, Alex is like, Alex doesn't steal a lot of bases and Alex is diving back. He's like, okay, okay, okay. Can we get on with this thing now? Can we play the game a little bit? And then there was a play at first base where he put his foot in front of first base and Brantley went to go touch first. And it just so happened that the timing steps on Joe Kelly's ankle and Joe Kelly takes umbrage with that. He could have stopped and just said, Hey, Hey, you good. I'm good. My foot got in the way. I was in a bad spot. My bad. But instead, Gives him a dirty look. The benches start yelling at him. And then he strikes out Correa and we have that. But I think you bring up probably the best point in all of this that hasn't been talked about literally because I didn't bring it up on our broadcast. I'm going to steal it and bring it up today. Yeah, bring it up tonight. I'll listen. credit for it. But the fact that it could have stopped after the throw behind Alex Bregman, and that's where you really hope it does stop tonight. Yeah. Well, and I hope that people understand. I mean, you and I played baseball for a long time. And uh, I, I think that this is what I've really learned about the podcast is some of these things that are innate or understood by us, uh, or maybe not understood by the general population, or even some of the listeners. And I think you bring a lot of insight in the broadcast by doing that. But it's really hard to explain the unwritten rules to people. But I think that's kind of what you just said, like, you're always looking for the like the closure. And it's just like punching your brother in the backseat, right? It all started when he hit me back. <laughs> You know, it's like, who gets the last swing in? Who does this? But I think once Joe Kelly sent that message and the way Bregman reacted, which is the other part of the equation, right? It takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. It was over and done with as far as I was concerned. As As a viewer, I was like, it's over and done with. And then, like you said, the chirping and the like taking umbrage with things. I don't know. I feel like over the years of playing, I learned to handle those things and you learn to control your emotions. And, you know, there are times when it'll get the best of you. I just don't think that was the time to let it go. Uh, or to let that happen. And, and Carlos said as much. And I think the other point I want to bring up that you didn't bring up earlier that you just touched on is the audio has been fantastic because there are no fans. Those cardboard fans are quiet. And when there's no fans in there, I mean, you can hear the conversations and it's, I actually appreciate that. And I think fans will appreciate it more when they see the respect between teams, but also they're able to hear what the communication is. And I always said that before, like the way the guys converse with umpires or the way they talk at first base or, um, you know, I I think all of that could, we talked about that being, it could be something that would um, provide a lot of insight to folks that want to play baseball at the highest level or enjoy it at the highest level to hear some of the conversations going on. And I think to your point, we were able to hear that Carlos um, felt like, you know, it could have been over and all of those guys thought it could have been over at that point. And, you know, sometimes things get a little ticky tack and sometimes that line in the back seat where you're punching your brother over doesn't, doesn't hold the, hold the, hold the line the way it should. So. Yeah. And those are good analogies and great points. And uh, yeah, if you're watching the broadcast tonight, uh, you'll hear, you'll hear this podcast probably on Friday, but uh, just know that I will give David Tuttle the credit he is due. And speaking of credit, (laughs) but speaking of things that should be over, but will probably not be over for a very long time is COVID-19. And it is now having a direct impact on one particular team in major league baseball. It is the Miami Marlins Uh, Tuttle. I don't know how much you've read on this. I've read a little bit, but why don't you bring us in and let us know what's going on with the Miami Marlins? Because I love this has it. been a really big story. That I'm the leader. Oh, I did have one thing on the bench clearing. Uh, oh, brawl, sorry. Which, no, I no, don't no, want to I, cut that off, man. If you got more, bring no, it. No, no, I think we're done. We're, we're trying to go quick, as we said. I wrote a note yesterday saying, should guys put on their masks to go brawl out oh, there? Man. Like, you know, it's like, oh, my God, we got to hop over. Oh, no, put on your mask. Then we'll go because guys are putting it on at first base. So that's something you could mention on the broadcast. Like, all right, from now on, when you guys brawl, Make sure you pull your shirt and your mask. You brought up COVID and that made me think of it. So there's going to be a new protocol when bench is clear. Please make sure when you enter the field with the other team and you're going to throw haymakers, 
be wearing a mask, folks. Come on. That's outstanding. That's a Great public point. service announcement. I thought about it when they were running out there like, hey, they walk down to first, they put on a mask, but they're out there like throwing. So, <laughs> or, uh, or come out there with your negative test and go, okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't know much about it. I do know what I read and that some of it was on the AP and my mom sent me an article actually about Manfred, how they're saying he's to blame for this because there isn't a true bubble. Um, you know, for baseball, they're trying to keep it in a, a bubble uh, type scenario. But I thought the interesting piece was, do we blame Manfred? Who do we blame for all this? But you do not want to leave health and well-being, especially when uh, younger folks aren't as, uh, I don't know, apt to get COVID-19 up to, they said like two guys on the team had it and they were like, oh, I feel fine. You know, my fever's not high or whatever. Like, I think we can play. And it's like, all right, so they're in the locker room, they're behaving normal, they didn't stay in the hotel, and all of a sudden, it spreads a little bit. And then, you know, a couple of guys get together and it spreads again. I mean, the way the article that I read wrote, it was, two guys had it like on Friday night, or I was on vacation, so it wasn't Friday, but two guys had it on Wednesday, and by Friday or Saturday, like 17 had it. Yeah. It's like, well, they're doing something besides uh, hanging out in the locker room and the dugout, or they, uh, they just, you know, why – how could you leave that decision up to, you know, 22, 23 year old guys, if they know they have it, like get the medical people involved. What is the protocols in place? And is that Manfred's fault or is it not? But it went from two to 17 in a hurry. And that's going to affect all the teams they're playing and their 60 man squad and all that stuff. So. Yeah. And it, you know what? I mean, this just kind of fuels the, the conversation we've been having since March when this thing hit. We don't know how to handle this damn virus, you know, whether it be wear the mask, not wear the mask, social distance, lockdown, shut down, open up. We don't know, but we know that we're in an open environment in baseball. And to your point, this is a learning experience. Now we have an actual case where we can say, okay, that was not a very good idea. As soon as we know that one of these guys have it, get him out of there, get the two guys out of there and get the hell away from them because it spreads so quickly. And now we have, you know, I mean, statistical, factual data that says, yes, this thing is going to spread like wildfire if you get anybody near it. Yeah. Now you can start to blame people. Do you blame Don Mattingly for not recognizing the situation or Derek Jeter or a GM and say, hey, we shouldn't have played that day, should have pulled the plug on the game? Or do you look to the Phillies and go, as soon as the Phillies got information, should they have walked off the field? Because now we're hearing that the you know teams don't want to go down and play in Miami. And I don't know if it's a if it's a knock on the Marlins or knock on Florida or a knock on Miami, I don't know, you know, whatever the decision is, they don't want to go into that environment. Um, and they haven't clarified that, but is it Manfred's fault? Manfred's getting the, the test results. Is there somebody internally who's heading, you know, a task force or whatever you want to call it for COVID that might've seen a little red flare go up and go, Hmm, that doesn't look good. Maybe we should try and avoid a situation where we expose more people, but they went ahead and played it. And now we're seeing the repercussions of it. So if this happens again, you better darn well believe that they're going to pull the plug on whatever team that is and get them out of the situation and lock them down. Uh, and right now, the Miami Marlins, all of them, whoever was on that road trip is now in a hotel in Philadelphia waiting this thing out for the next week, I believe it is. And they're going to be testing every single day. Uh, so it's kind of a unique situation. But again, who knew? Who knows? How can you blame something on somebody that we didn't know what was going to happen? We had an idea it might but there was nothing specific. It's just a crazy incident. And now Major League Baseball is trying to patchwork together a schedule to get them through this thing. Well, I mean, those are the protocols, as I said before, we talked a lot in the last few podcasts about um, what they should have been discussing. And we were trying to say, this is not a um, you know collective bargaining time. This is a time to put protocols and steps in place. And I think that's why Manfred got a lot of heat, especially in the article that yeah. I read. And he got a lot of heat because of the fact that these protocols aren't already in place. And you're letting these 22 year olds, I mean, if you tested positive, then you stay at the hotel. And then who are the officials that are, you know, I don't know if this is like the Olympic style testing or if they have an independent party that's at each hotel or a team member, because maybe mm -hmm. it was the trainer that said, Oh no, his fever's not elevated, but he tests. I mean, these are not, these are not clear, clearly defined lines. And I know it only takes like this, this one little, Oh yeah, well, this is something we didn't yeah, think about. And that's why Manfred's getting a lot of heat. The protocol should have been in place before it happened, but to go from two to 17, um, you know, 
remember, just like they, uh, Dame Lillard said about the NBA bubble, <laughs> like these guys aren't going to follow the, uh, the bubble either. I mean, he just said there's just no way they can do it. You got 21, 22-year-old, you know, 26-year-old guys, like healthy in their prime, you know, and have a little bit of money. Yeah. Then – they're going to try and they're going to try and do some things. And so maybe it's just hang out together or maybe they felt invincible, but letting them make the decision about whether they should play or not does not sound like a good idea. And I think I could have figured that out prior to, you know, prior to letting that happen. Yeah, that was bad news. Uh, I got a question though, just, just in talking through this and understanding that Florida is a hot spot. Now we have a team in Miami, Florida, who comes up with all these positive tests uh, there was, a, I think there was an article a week before that said that Miami Dolphin guys are at four of them have been tested and they got uh, positive. You know, what is this, you know, you talked about the protocol and other leagues learning from what's going on, you know, and the NBA bubble is in Orlando, but I mean, you know, the NFL is trying to follow the model of major league baseball and not putting everybody in a bubble and allowing them to travel and have training camps. You know, I wonder, you know, what is the protocol going to change? Are they even going to think about having training camps in Florida? What does it mean for golf that wants to do a Florida swing and have some tournaments down there? You know, I think these are all things that other sports are going to have to look at and go, man, we don't want to be that guy because that was a bad example that the Marlins set. It was. And, I, you know, I don't know if there's a definitive answer to that. The protocol is, you know, is, is going to be thought about. I mean, the NFL keep, kept – or keeps acting like because their season isn't coming up, you know, mm -hmm. it's two months away or three months away. Well, we're not going to have a cure. I just feel like the bubble thing um, seems to have worked a little bit better for the NBA. And I just, it's yeah. not even about the bubble necessarily. Like you said, these teams are hanging out together. So if no one in the Astros has it and they're testing and they can keep that within a bubble, I guess playing the other teams, you brought up a really interesting point about Florida being a hotbed, you know, the governor there saying it doesn't matter what statistics say, we're going to, you know, be an open society. So I didn't think about it from a state perspective, like, all right, we'll play everywhere, but we won't go to Florida or Texas mm -hmm. or California, wherever the cases are rising. But again, it's very convoluted, very confusing. And I don't know if there's a right answer. I will say the independent party sounds good to me in the sense that maybe they hire 10 or so people to follow the team around and they conduct the yeah. testing and they have the protocols in place. So it's almost like another team, you know, like the umpires yeah. have this team travel around. I just think that seems to be a good solution. And I don't know, I've read articles on both sides or heard information on both sides about whether the NFL needs a bubble or not. I, I just, I don't know. They need a lot of guys too. We've already talked about that, you know, 53 man roster, from oh, 90 man. guys like you're gonna have 90 guys in a sweaty hot environment like hanging out together i, I just and playing a contact sport that's yeah. nuts anyway we want our jeff schwartz said it on our podcast you know we want our football so the consumer yep. is gonna probably dictate a lot more but uh but it feels weird I, I wanted to point out something too and maybe it's a good time to transition with the um mariners astro series that i watched mm -hmm. and tory hunter brought this up a while ago. So I'm moving off of COVID a little bit just to shine oh, a little man. silver, silver You're lining on this thing. Let's go. Hey, no, a little, little silver lining here. Um, watching the Mariners play. I mean, the Astros are definitely the better team. That guy, that closer they brought in, not consistent, but man, he's oh. got a sweeping slider. That guy, the, the only, you didn't mm -hmm. get to see him till late in the series, of course. But Tori Hunter brought up the fact that, you know, African Americans are typically playing basketball and football and they're staying away from baseball. And there's a lot of yeah, reasons man. for that. But I looked at the Mariners lineup and they had Crawford and they had shed long and they had that Lewis kid in center field and, and Alex, right Smith. Fielder, Alex Smith and Alex Smith, the four guys in the middle of that lineup are two, three, four. It came in all African American guys, all super young and they looked good. The good. center fielder Lewis looked really good. You commented on, I was like, so hey, I don't know what the Mariners are doing differently to have, you know, kind of the core group of their young prospects be African-American. I know there's guys, you know, Michael Brantley and Mookie Betts, and there's t definitely yeah. enough good athletes from an African-American perspective playing baseball. But I just thought, wow, I mean, whatever the Mariners did, they're doing it right because they're getting the best athletes and they're getting these guys that are, um, you know, that, that had been kind of diminishing from, uh, from baseball and from the farm systems and from actually just wanting to play professional baseball. And I just thought that core group of guys stuck out to me mm -hmm. when I was watching the broadcast. I don't know what you thought about that. No, I was excited to see it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you and I came up in the, in the mid nineties where 
you know, there were plenty of, of Latin American and African American and then all of us other, you know, American dudes going out there and playing the game. So it really, it wasn't a thought process, I yeah. think, in the mid, in the, before the 2000s. And, you know, there's, there's a shift in a lot of things, both societally and baseball wise or sports. I think it's more of a sports mm -hmm. thing because, you know, baseball, it takes a little bit longer to accrue wealth. You have to go through the minor leagues. You got to go through six years of my, of uh, club control before you get to free agency. So, your earning window is pushed back a little bit in a, in comparison to the NFL, NBA, uh, and other sports that are out there. So, I yeah. think that has a little bit to do with it. And then you get on the societal side, and there are things to 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 talk about. But it would be great to hear, you know hear Torrey Hunter, Latroy Hawkins, who's been like really at the forefront of talking about the diversity in baseball. Cause I completely agree. I don't think that there, you know, there's, there's lacking of, of uh, resources as far as having, you know, a, a multi diverse coaching staff or front office uh, people or players. Yeah. There's something going on internally that is, is not, not promoting the diversity within baseball and that's what needs to be addressed and it would be great to hear from some of those guys and actually talk about what their beliefs might be on why that's happening inside baseball and how to correct it and make it better because you and I played with plenty of guys that are geniuses in baseball yeah. and can actually explain it and went through the struggles of competing it and want other people to succeed it's just a matter of getting them to be motivated to be in those positions and fight through some of the barriers that may still exist. Yeah. And I mean, boy, you took that in a, in, in a better place than I even thought about before. I just, I don't even think there's a lack of diversity, maybe sometimes exposure or desire. I think it's usually desire. And as you said, the earning window and things like that um, are, are definitely contributing factors. I just was really impressed because we, we continue to hear the negative and the focus on the fact that, you know, there isn't a lot of diversity when I, I personally believe baseball is probably the most diverse sport on the planet in terms of, you know, basketball is trying to get there, I know. But I mean, gosh, like you said, Cubans and, you know, Dominicans and Venezuelans. And Asian. Asian. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Asians are, I mean, it's just. The Car and, all the Caribbeans and the Curacao, the Dutch. I mean, yeah, there's I mean, Australian. There's, yeah. yeah, it's just, a, I mean, it's, it's open to everyone, obviously, like most sports, if you have the ability and you can get to the highest level. It was just really nice because the negativity around the diversity has been, you know, African-Americans, like you said, the, the earning window, they're not as in, um, um, they don't have as much desire to play baseball because of the earning window. Also, they haven't been exposed to it. Like the inner cities aren't having, uh, as, you know, as good of uh, as many opportunities, I should say, to play baseball because mm -hmm. of the lack of landscape or lack of ability to put a field over here and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, man, I'm watching this Mariners game and the middle of the lineup was all super young. And man, Lewis, I mean, you mentioned on the broadcast, that guy, dude, he's going to be a good player. Dude, and he's, he's a like, player, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's <laughs> taking what they give him. And anyway, so just a little side note, I was really impressed by the, uh, by the Mariners lineup. And, you know, obviously they can be thought of, hopefully with the talent they have, they can be thought of maybe as kind of that pre Astros where the Astros were when they yeah. were losing a hundred games, you know, before they turned the corner and started winning a hundred games. No, that's a, that's an excellent point. I believe that's a team to keep an eye on too, because if those guys keep swinging it the way they can, it's gonna it's gonna be a, a pretty formidable team. Just add some pitching, and you're all right. Uh, I know we may feel like we're a little bit rushed, but that's a great topic that I think should come up again okay. with some people that we know of that can actually help us maybe talk through some of those issues and just make that one podcast because I think it's a great topic and a great subject. And again, the more we know, the more we can deal with it and hopefully move forward. And in moving forward. I know you've been waiting for this, man. I, and I'm kind of curious. I know you've got a stockpile of topics, but what'll Ooh, I do. Tuttle say? Yeah, I got a good one today. And maybe you and I should do a, a virtual handshake as well. So uh, as most of the folks know, I went on a little vacation last week and uh, it was really nice to, I'm terrible at social media. So I apologize for that. Even in the real world. I mean, I'm just terrible. So it's okay to be focused on the family. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I just, I don't even mean on social. I mean, I don't even mean on vacation. I mean, I'm terrible in general, but uh, so <laughs> I got to come on the podcast you. and yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, that's what you're supposed to do. And and that leads into what will Tuttle say, which is you're trying to cover for me. So we should do a virtual handshake today. So fantastic story I read about these, uh, about these two uh, guys. And you got to let me know if you heard about these two guys in Wisconsin 
Uh, one guy oh. won the lottery. You didn't hear this. this is awesome. So these two guys have been friends for 32 years. One of them is now a retired firefighter, I think. And the other one's going to retire because he won the lottery. Um, they made a handshake when they were like 18, 19 years old, early on in their career. And they're like, dude, if I ever win the lottery, like, you know, I promise I'll include you. And as you can imagine, these guys aren't as close. They're not like, you know, they don't do a podcast every week together. They were just fishing buddies. They stay in touch. They would still buy lottery tickets and send the guy pictures like, Hey, you know, I won hundred bucks and you know, I'm still working on it. And the other guy would too. So they won a $22 million Powerball. And this guy hadn't spoken to his buddy in like a year and a half. And I just think, you know, again, positivity. He could have just won the Powerball and, you know, kind of gone off into the sunset. The first call he makes is to his buddy. He goes, hey, you remember 28 years ago when we shook hands on the thing? Well, guess what? Today we just won $22 million. So they took the cash payout, which was like 16, $16.7 million. And each got a check for about six mil. And dude, how incredible is that? That's awesome. Dude, the coolest story. And I'm like, hey, there's a guy that's a man of his word. They live in a small town in Wisconsin. They're super happy. And now they can both kind of retire and travel a little bit, obviously, when COVID gets out. But I just really like the, uh, it's not even the down home, like genuine, whatever. It's kind of like in this day and age where we see a, a lot of, you know, kind of moral indecency and some kind of suspect issues and things integrity. like that. Integrity has been, you know, a little lacking in some of the issues that I typically bring up and what will Tuttle say, whether it's putting your <laughs> golf cart back or, you know, cutting somebody off in traffic, whatever it is. But uh, um, anyway, I just, it was a really warm story. You can look it up on the internet. Um, two guys in Wisconsin, the one guy hadn't heard from the other guy in a long time, but he called his buddy up to honor a, basically a 30 year old handshake and say, Hey, guess what? We won the Powerball and I got 6 million bucks for you. So Blum, when you win the Powerball, <laughs> we just did a virtual handshake. Reach out to me, buddy. Reach out to me. So that's what I'll tell say. It's positive. It's short. It's quick, but man, fantastic story. I'm just glad. And I'm glad we've heard the story. I'm glad we also have it documented. So when either of us win the lottery, <laughs> we're going to be held accountable because we're going to replay this over that's and right. over and over again. Yeah. And even to the point where when we get Joe Rogan money, We'll, oh, we'll go halfsies. All, All right. right, we'll go halfsies. That's fair. I'm in on that. That would be winning lottery for me since I don't play the lottery. <laughs> I better, we can't split the lottery ticket because I haven't started playing yet. So, oh, you know. yeah, the odds aren't in our favor. We need to start buying, man. <laughs> I guess we got to start buying lottery <laughs> tickets. That would help our cause for sure. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And I've got a little bit of a blast for myself, just on Blum's Blast. And it's a little bit of background into some of the broadcasts that we do. It has been odd without the uh, fans out there. It's a little strange. And I, you heard me get kind of quiet during the bench clearing because part of me was just uh, astonished at what was going on. But the other part was, is I had my ear in my headset. I, I had my hands over my headset going, oh, you can hear everything they're saying. This is awesome. But I love the fact, like you pointed out earlier, that you can hear the communication. Uh, you know, catchers have to be real quiet when they move and set up. There's so many subtle intricacies that are great about the broadcast now because you can hear everything, whether it be a guy dropping an F-bomb. I know that, I don't know if you saw this, but Granky was pitching the other day and he threw a curveball. And I mean, literally you could hear the snap out of the hand and he goes, damn it. <laughs> Cause he knew it wasn't he the knew pitch. He didn't snap it. Yeah. He knew. But it's, it's, it's amazing that guys at that level, they can know immediately out of the hand, it's not good or immediately off the bat, they know it's not going to be a hit. And you're like, ah, so uh, that's been a lot of fun. The, the pop of the gloves been amazing. The crack of the bat's been incredible. That part's been fun. Uh, but just a little more behind the scenes in the broadcast. And for those of you who are wondering, because there was a little question about when Justin Verlander got hurt, there was an article that came out during the broadcast from the Houston Chronicle saying that Justin Verlander hurt his forearm. He's out for the season. And we took a little bit of heat as a broadcast team about not breaking the news. I saw you respond to that very yeah. eloquently, I guess. I tried to be directly. polite about it. I mean, I wasn't, I mean, it, it, it kind of spiraled out of control like Twitter normally does, but I appreciate the backup, by the way, fans, you're great. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just trying to mention the fact, and I'll try and clarify it right here, is I hate to break it to you. This, is, this will be the breaking news I break. I am a baseball broadcaster. I'm not a news broadcaster. And that means if I don't have confirmed news from the Houston Astros PR staff or somebody in the organization, I will not speculate on it. 
Yeah. I may guess on how it happened or what may have happened, but until it is confirmed, I am not going to say anything about it because I don't think it's appropriate to speculate on something like that because I don't want to be the guy that's wrong and I love my job. So I want to keep it. And as you found out later on, guess what happened? We don't know if the Chronicle story is right about him being out for the season. All we know is that for the next two weeks, he's not out for the season. So he could come back in about four weeks. Who knows? But we are not in the, in the job of breaking injury news during a broadcast, unless it is specifically written to me and given to me by an Astro uh, personnel. Yeah, and there's a lot of variables there, which is you do work for the Astros, so you're not allowed to speculate anyway. What are you supposed to say? Like, I mean, if you saw some guy doing something in the locker room, you're not allowed to say it. I know you're <laughs> tier three access we, these days. We are but... privy to more information than most. And yes, exactly. to Tuttle's point, we do hold on to some stuff. We have an right. idea, yeah. but I can't throw the ideas around, number one, yeah. because they may not be right, and I don't want to ruin the trust I've developed underneath. Right. And that's, that's what I'm saying. It's, you, you may not be right, but you also saw some things or have information that could affect what you're speculating about. So that's, I mean, that, it makes perfect sense to me. And as you said, you're not a news broadcaster, you're an employee of the Astros. So interesting. Um, yeah, I think the heat you took was that you didn't speak about it on the broadcast. Am I correct? Yeah. I'm yeah, not, yeah I'm that's not gonna, what I thought. I'm not going to, hey, there's a, there's a newspaper article about this. Yeah. Uh, did you hear it? You know, yeah. what, what good is that going to do me? It doesn't do any good, yeah. Is this related to his groin or his arm now? Um, it's his arm. Oh, okay. But you, you are but, allowed to talk about that. Yeah, no, yeah. they said that before. I was just Yeah, it was a forearm strain, and I don't yeah. know if you've been paying attention. This, this will probably be something we can talk about uh, next week because there will probably be two or three more injuries to elbows or shoulders, but pitchers are getting hurt at, at an alarming rate. They're, uh, mm. Mike Michaelis for the Cardinals – is getting Tommy John surgery right now. And Corey Kluber for the Rangers came out with a shoulder strain. I mean, and then Verlander, and there's several other guys out there. It's a little concerning. And I don't know, you know, is there an explanation for it? Is it because they started, stopped, started up again, short summer camp, and then went all, you know, balls out for, for a couple starts? I don't know, man. It's, it, but it's kind of frightening. No, they're just old. No, 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> No. I don't know about Michaelis. They've said he's thrown close to 55 or more than 55,000 pitches. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I threw a thousand innings essentially in the minor leagues. So a thousand innings and you figure, I mean, it's I don't like know, 55,000. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's got to get up there, right? So you got to be at like 30,000 pitches. I mean, 15 yeah. pitches is a quick inning, right? You had those 40 pitch innings that you hated. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I mean, so yeah, 55,000 pitches. And people mis misrepresent this, I think, like in football. They're like, oh, yeah, well, we had training camp, and, you know, we went light. We went shoulder pads and shorts. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot replicate game speed in any high-level sport. You can't replicate it in Olympic skiing. You can't rep – I mean, there's no way Verlander's throwing BP, like even that cage Even BP in inner squad. In yeah. inner squad, there's just no, no way. way. You just can't replicate it because your life depends on it and your uh, outcomes depend on it, and these numbers are your numbers, you, you just can't. So that extra little oomph, regardless of what kind of shape you're in, and as you said, we started, we were ramping up, we stopped, we kept going. I mean, that may be a contributing factor, but most of it is, hey, you know, typically at this point in the season, you'd have a lot of juice, and that is one thing that we hadn't discussed or hadn't thought of until some of these injuries started popping up is, this is a this is a sprint. Baseball is not a sprint sport. So you got <laughs> good, sixty good games, and now we're four games, five games in. We got fifty five games left. Like leave it all out on the field. And you know, I think for like you said, for workhorses, like two hundred plus inning guys, yeah. sprinting and you know leaving all out on the field that that's a closer, a short man thing. That's not a that's not a long guy thing. And you got to build up, and you got to you know have the. Uh, you know, have the longevity and the, uh, I don't know, what is it? The uh, conditioning and the strength to do it. And I think yeah. you, you make a very good point. It could a actually be, um, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see right in the next week. If there are a couple more injuries, we'll definitely see um, mm -hmm. some conversation mm -hmm. about it. Yep. Uh, the only cool thing is, is, you know, is it's led to a lot of debuts. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or bad thing, but we've seen a lot of debuts and guys getting the chance to pitch it uh, literally pitched in a ball last season. So it's been kind of wild to watch some of these games. Yeah. Uh, but uh, any parting shots before we close the bleachers on this quick podcast? We touched on some pretty quality stuff, and the content was nice, bro. Yeah, maybe we'll have to shorten this up. You know, we got no mailbag, no <laughs> guests, and just we're in a hurry. You know, we're on, uh, up against the clock. We should shorten it up. I will say, you know, there is this little twinge in the back of my head that says, 
Um, and it's not this, this isn't the twinge I'm feeling. <laughs> um, that lets me know when I see these guys coming out, they're like, yeah, he was combined, you know, five, R- five ERA between double A AA and triple A last year. And you're like, all right, I, this could have been my shot, man. A COVID year. Timing could, is everything. I could have been, on, I could have been, I could have been somebody. I could have been on that 60 man roster. You know, Hey, here's this journeyman at this point. He's 28. Like, hey man, to we're going to keep this guy. Yeah. All of a sudden this guy's done it. So anyway, that, that did thought did cross my mind. Um, one last thing, because I did golf on vacation and you've been golfing a lot and I'd love for you to come out and golf. Golfing is by far the best COVID-19 activity I've found. It is Ever. awesome. Yeah, yep. you wear the mask into the clubhouse or under the tent when they're outside, you take it down and then you're out in the grass. I was in the ocean as well. That was another good one, surfing, body right. surfing oh, and nice. skinboarding was great. But oh, dude, baby. golf, you've been telling me about golf and now, I mean, you and I usually golf together anyway, but I was like, dude, this is something where you actually feel some sense of normalcy out on the mm. golf course. Aside yeah, you from can the fact get lost I, for a little while. Yeah, aside from the fact I played fairly decent as well, I might have to get a new driver. I'm thinking, but that's a dude. You're you're sneaky good. You play it down, but you hustle everybody, man. Get that new driver and start launching. Let's go. Yeah, I got to come play with you, man. I got to make my trip out to Houston. We got to get this yeah. thing wrapped up so we can have some on site like uh, St. Arnold's. Dude, absolutely. Well, there would be St. Arnold's. Oh man, yeah, that would be a good time. Yes, it would be a good time, especially after COVID. We're gonna party like it's 1999. Anyway, Blummer, I don't have any parting shots. Obviously, the shout out to the health healthcare workers and uh, the frontline folks, and yep. you know our uh, our our request to have the you know the vaccine figured out now and then and all that still goes man we're still under time crunch we need some sense of <laughs> no man, yeah get that vaccine going boys that's what i'm pointing at not for us i'm talking about yeah. get that vaccine man speed that thing up no i'm with you yeah no i'm with you so that request still stands is what i was gonna say yep. so throw it back to you yeah get the metallica going crank it out get mad get angry at this virus figure it out and fix it so we can all get back out there and enjoy each other and to just reiterate what Tuttle's saying, man, frontline people, you are doing an amazing job. Keep it up. I know it ain't easy, and you're not getting the accolades you should. But right here on Bleacher Blums, we're going to give you all the love we can. And uh, just uh, be safe, stay calm, wash those hands, sanitize, and keep watching Astros baseball and listening and watching to Bleacher Blums because we are back. The hiatus is over, and we have got some great baseball to talk about. I even feel like we're going to have some NBA and NFL next week. We'll be ready for that. What do you think they should do, Tuttle, before we get out of here? Uh, for what? NBA and, and... No, just what do we do? I'll let you take us out. Oh, I got you. Hey, I get to take us out. Our listeners and everyone else should get after it and believe it. <laughs>